she. Um, the quote I chose for today's class, thus the gravest foolishness of the intellectual animals is to believe that they are doing things when indeed they cannot do anything. They are simple human marionettes moved by unknown forces. We talked a little bit about this last week. We know the unknown forces, the actual, the various egos, the various elements of our subconscious. Um, this is kind of an, a, a sort of a, a startling term, and this is something that, that Master Samuel uses to describe um, your average human. Uh, he refers to us as intellectual animals, the idea that the true human being is mm -hmm. one that's fully spiritually developed. So until we reach that level, we're just simply, um, you know, I mean, we are mammals. We're, you know, hairy and we, we breathe and all that kind of stuff. We're composed of physical matter. So that's why he refers us to intellectual animals. The difference between humans and animals is we have the intellect which of course gives us the free will and that, the various things that come along with that. And we'll be examining that concept a, a bit uh, later on in the, in the course itself. So what he's talking about with this particular quote is we like to think that we're in control, that we know what we're doing, where we're going, and all that kind of thing, when in the end we really don't have uh, the willpower that we think we do. We really don't have the free will that we think we do. We're just simply uh, you know, puppets dancing to the, uh, the puppet master, the puppet masters of course being the various egos in our subconscious. Uh, the five centers, um, inside each of us are five centers of activity which are responsible for everything from our thoughts to our emotions to our movements to our instincts. They're like little, almost like little computers or little machines that drive our entire system. These centers consume various energies within our organism, which is just like any motor or any uh, vehicle or any engine or any kind of machine is going to need some sort of a fuel. For example, if we have a, a you know, a, um, like a car engine, that's going to consume uh, fuel uh, in order to run, in order to perform work. The various centers that we have in our bodies, they all feed off different types of energy, and that's what we're going to look at today. And one of the biggest problems we face is a huge imbalance of the way we use energies in our systems because we don't correctly balance, we don't correctly manage the five centers. And that's really what we're going to look at uh, for the rest of this lecture. For example, we can think of basic types of energies that we understand. Our movements use calories. We know we have to eat food and that food is digested, transformed into calories, which itself is a type of food energy. But we also have other energies in our body we really don't think too much about. For example, the intellectual energies like the whole intellectual process and how it works and the fuel that it runs on. Another example of energies are the sexual energies, the whole sexual reproductive system and the energies that it runs on. But we'll also see today as well, we have emotional energies, and they're a different type of energy altogether from intellectual and from sexual. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the five centers. The first one we refer to as the intellectual center. The second one is the motor center. The third one is the emotional center, the fourth one is the instinctive, and the fifth one is the sexual. And they have a corresponding area on the body as well. Um, the intellectual center makes sense, right? It's located in the brain. The motor center is the upper spine, the cerebellum, this section right here at the, the base of our skull. The emotional center, that's the solar plexus, that's right here. And we can probably relate a bit about that. Uh, think of when you're really upset or really emotional, one of the first things that gets affected is the digestion because that's where all that energy is located in that particular region. The instinctive center is located uh, in the cosix, the tip of the tail bone, and also shares some um, similarity with the adrenal glands. And you can kind of think about um, you know, the fight or flight instinct as a type of instinct in the adrenal glands, of course, are dumping adrenaline in the system and that kind of stuff. That's where that's located, and that, obviously, right? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the obvious one. Now, these are what we call the five inferior centers. Everybody walking around has these five. But there's also two higher ones that we can develop, something called the superior emotional center and something called the superior intellectual center. And we'll look at those later on today, but everybody has these five, but there's also two additional ones that can be developed. We kind of have them, but they're kind of latent. We don't really use them. And one of the goals in these studies as well is to develop the superior emotional center and the superior intellectual center. What we'll see today, the superior emotional center and the superior intellectual center, they're tools of the essence. They're tools of the consciousness 
while these really become tools of the ego. So when we start eliminating ego and developing our higher self, developing our consciousness, then we start being able to access the superior emotional center and the superior intellectual center. We'll talk more about that as well. <clears throat> now the intellectual center, let's, let's start looking at each of these in detail. The intellectual center comes as no surprise. This is the source of ideas, thoughts, all that kind of stuff. And the intellect itself, of course, is extremely useful. We use it all the time. It ne it's needed for all the activities of the day, to communicate with other people, to plan, to do our work. We use the intellectual center all the time. It's a very necessary thing. Um, when we have a thought, when we have an idea, if we're thinking of something, planning something, we're using the intellectual center. Okay, and that's something that we need for everything that we do in our course of day-to-day -day activities. Thoughts drive daily activities and the overall scheme of one's life. And we've been talking about the idea um, that we have about 30 to 40,000 thoughts a day. So the intellectual center is very busy. It's like an engine that's constantly revving really high, producing all kinds of, of thoughts and ideas and that kind of stuff. And it's those thoughts and ideas that do drive our daily activities and do drive the overall schemes of our life, what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, planning for the future, all that kind of stuff. But interestingly enough, as fast as we think of this is, you know, we talk about thinking fast on our feet and all that, that kind of stuff, as fully aware we are of all those various thoughts, it ends up being, and this is an interesting thing, the slowest of all the centers. The one that we rely on the most, the one that we're, we're most familiar with, that ends up being the slowest of all the five centers. It processes information much slower than the other centers do. And that causes some problems that we'll examine today as well. This is a quote regarding the intellectual center. In the intellect, we have an endless train of thoughts that keep going and going. This allows no peace, and with the multitude of images that they bring, they compel each person to live their lives in a daydream, only partially seeing life and interpreting it according to our own subjective viewpoint. That's the catch with the intellectual center. As useful as it is, uh, it becomes something that we have very little control mm -hmm. over. If we've already experienced that if we've tried meditating and discovered mm -hmm. how hard it is to actually stop and slow this center down. It becomes so overused and so overactive that it ends up becoming a s distraction. And it's one of the reasons why we find our consciousness asleep, because we can't really focus in the moment because of all the stuff that's being generated by the intellectual center. It becomes a giant distraction and compels us to live with our consciousness asleep, trapped in a continual daydream, only partially seeing the reality around us and interpreting it according to our own subjective viewpoint. Because how we interpret the world uh, relies heavily on the intellectual center, the experiences from our past, memories, you know, inherited beliefs, prejudices, education, all that kind of stuff, that really colors our viewpoint on reality, on the world around us. Looking at the motor center now, uh, the motor center is the center that's responsible for the physical activity. If the intellectual center is generating our thoughts and ideas, the motor center is what really controls the physical body, the various movements that we have. Now the motor center is faster than the intellectual center. Um, think of a, a somebody who can type really fast or if you're familiar with playing an instrument. It's your hands move on your own. It's when you try to stop to think about it, that's when you make a mistake. Think of somebody that's proficient at typing. They're, they're not having to think about where their fingers are going. Sometimes when you stop to think about what you're going to do next, that's when you slow down and that's when you make a mistake. I'm a musician myself, so I can relate to this. When you're working on a really complicated piece, um, they always say, stop thinking about it. You know, start thinking about something else and let your hands do what they need to do. Because if you try to put the intellect in place to think what's the next step, because the intellectual center is slower than the emotional center, it slows the whole process down and you're not able to, to be as dexterous as you would be if you just let the motor center do its thing. Part of the whole process of practicing is training the motor center. So you can think of any physical skill, any type of athletic ability, anything from playing an instrument, typing. Really what you're doing there when you're practicing is training the motor center, not so much the intellectual center. The motor center, curiously enough, is the source of our habits, which we must study through self-observation. When we talked about self-observation, we talked about you know, being aware of the various things that are happening in our organism. Not just aware of our thoughts, but also aware of our emotions 
and aware of our actions. There's so many things that we do that we're not fully aware of. I think I talked before about the idea of we've all done this, especially if you drive. If you've had your mind really involved on something, you drive and then you get to your destination and you stop and realize I'm already here and I don't remember a good portion of this drive and uh oh, and that's how a lot of accidents happen. That's an example of a habit. We just, the motor center just does its own thing. We drive the same route to work every day, so the motor center just makes the same turns in the same places, stopping at the same intersections, to the point that we don't even have to be there anymore. Our mind can be somewhere else, and the motor center will take care of the drive for us. We waste a ton of energy when we're not aware of our movements. And this is something we'll look at uh, a bit later today as well. We'll talk about the consequences of wasting the various types of energy but we waste a lot of energy through the motor center. Just like that endless train of thoughts we get in the intellect, that wastes a lot of intellectual energy. It's like having a car going nowhere, but idling constantly. There's no reason for that engine to be on all the time. We can relate to the endless train of thoughts that fly through our mind, and we can understand that, yeah, if I'm thinking about a lot of silly things, that is kind of a waste of energy, and, you know, if I could be focusing on more important things. But we also waste all kinds of energy through the motor center as well. Uh, most of us aren't even aware of the habits which condition our lives. There's all kinds of different routines and habits that we have that are really a function of the motor center. Silly little things, like every day when we get ready, we probably do the same routine in the morning. Go downstairs, put the coffee maker on, you go in the shower, you wash your body in the same way, you grab the soap in the same hand, and we have these routines that we do over and over again. Because so much of our life is routine and mechanical, that's one of the things that allows us to not have to focus in the present moment. We don't have to be aware in that shower because it's routine. We can be worrying about work or we can be thinking about the weekend while we get ready in the morning. The motor center and this repetition, this mechanical uh, 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 routine that we have, that's one of the things that allows us to be uh, asleep for most of the day. Same thing, think of the things that we do at work. Sometimes we go into robot mode and it's not until something out of the ordinary happens that we realize that we're not really aware. If we're walking down the street and not paying attention, we could walk into somebody or trip on the sidewalk or walk into a telephone pole or something. And it's not until that happens that we realize we were oblivious to our surroundings. We were just trapped inside our own mind. So we have all kinds of different habits, different ways we waste energy with the motor center. We have to self-observe the way we act, the way we dress ourselves, the way we walk, and pay attention to some of these patterns. Rather than you know, being in a car driving and not paying attention, we should try being in the car and actually observing what it is that we do. Instead of on our drive to work in the morning, wondering what's going to happen at work, or thinking about uh, you know, perhaps a, a meeting that we have, or, or a difficult situation, or a problem in our life, what we should be doing is being in the car, observing where it is we are, and what it is we're doing. If everybody was in a car, practice self-observation, we'd have a lot less car accidents and a lot less injuries and fatalities on the road because we all know when we're not paying attention, when we're not in the present moment with awareness in a vehicle, that's when we get into a accidents. Okay, but we have to start being conscious of what it is we're thinking, what it is we're feeling, but also what it is that we're doing. When we get ready in the morning and have a shower, it's kind of a strange thing to say, but it's a really novel concept. We should actually be there having a shower. Not being at work, not being at the weekend, not being back in the summer, but be there in that shower, experiencing the present moment. Developing that consciousness, that awareness that exists in the present moment, not lost in a routine while we daydream and worry and plan and all that kind of stuff. We have to start thinking about not allowing our life to continue to unfold mechanically. The problem is we find ourselves like trains going over the same tracks again and again and again. If we really want to seek a change in our life, a positive change, then we have to break some of the routines that we have. Not only the intellectual routines, not only the um, emotional routines, but also the motor routines as well. We really have to look at the whole process of being human as, and this is a kind of a, not a, a pleasant thing to say, but we are very mechanical. Our thoughts are mechanical. We have the same thoughts at the same points in response to the same circumstances. 
our emotions in many situations are mechanical. If I insult you, you get offended. If I compliment you, you're happy is an example of a mechanical reaction. It's not just emotions and the thoughts that become mechanical, it's also our physical activities. Think of everything that we do from we get up until we go to bed. In some cases, it's just one giant routine after another. We're like a train going around and around on the same set of tracks. We should try to observe our movements when we become excited and notice how they differ from when we become depressed, when we become angry, fearful, that kind of stuff. What we'll eventually discover when we start working with self-observation is that these you know, thoughts that we have are related to the emotions that we have and are related to the actions that we have. It's like a package. Uh, for example, let's say when we're worried about something or nervous, you know, biting our nails or wringing our hands or tapping our fingers or drumming our feet, that's a package, okay? These are all things that are related to a state like being depressed, fearful, or angry. When we're really happy, there's something that we do physically. There's sets of thoughts that we have, there's sets of emotions that we experience, but there's also actions that we do. And it's funny, we not only have these, you know, thoughts and the feelings that define our personality, we have actions as well. You can spend a little bit of time with people and you can get to kind of see the different actions that define who they are. Whether it's the way they sit, whether it's the way they hold their hands, whether it's, you know, little things like what you're doing right there. There's all these things that are... I don't, we're not saying that they're bad. We're, they're just saying that there's, there's patterns. They're patterns that are related to our thoughts and they're related to our emotions. So not only do we react to life with various thoughts and various motions, we also <coughs> react with various actions as well. And when we go back and look at those actions, what we'll discover, and we'll look at this later on today when we talk more about the energies, that's wasting various energies as well. Sitting there nervously tapping your fingers or drumming your hands, that's using energies. And energies that are then feeding into the thoughts, that are keeping the thoughts racing, that are keeping the emotions racing, it's all tied together. So looking at the emotional center now, uh, the emotional center is an interesting one because it receives impressions from the exterior world. The emotional center is located in the area of the solar plexus, right where our belly button is. And just like when we were in our mother's womb, we received everything through our umbilical cord. We received all our food, our nourishment, everything came through our umbilical cord. Well, when we leave the room, when we, or we leave the womb and the umbilical cord is physically severed, uh, at a different level, that's still the receptive area of our body. Uh, it's very sensitive to the exterior world. We've all probably been in situations before where you've walked into an environment and just know that something's wrong. You just know you don't want to be there. You just know it's not a right place. In many cases, that relates to the emotional center. Okay, people that can receive impressions, people that are, are psychic are usually working with an overly developed emotional center. They're able to gather a lot of information. It's almost like an antenna. It's almost like our receiver that picks up all kinds of information about the exterior world. If you've ever uh, been somewhere that's been really unpleasant, uh, a place that has just been uh, not a very pleasant place, where there's been people there that have been very negative, it's not unusual for the digestive system to be upset either because of the activity that comes through that center. This is another way that we waste a ton of energy. As humans, we find ourselves being addicted to emotional energies. Okay, we have these thoughts that run in our every day, and we, you know, the thousands of thoughts a second. We have all these different actions we use to waste energy. But the emotional center, we waste energy through all kinds of different activities. For example, movies. As we're watching a movie, as we're enjoying that movie and getting caught up in that action, that drama, we're using emotional energy. Okay, watching television, going to see sports events, going to music concerts, these are all things that allow us to use the energy of the emotional center. And it's almost like if we spend a lot of time, you know, people that get really angry at sports events and get caught up in the, the drama and yelling and screaming, they're using that emotional energy. People that sit around watching movies, identifying with the actors and crying along with them, they're using emotional energy. And what we're doing while we're using that energy Thinking back to last week is the problem here is we're feeding the various egos. So if we like, you know, watching a lot of uh, 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 horror movies and, and violent movies and we're, you know, planning, watching all those scenes of revenge and all that kind of stuff, you're basically feeding the various egos that are associated with that. Just like people that get involved in, uh, you know, boxing and hockey because they want to watch the fights and the violence. That's because those egos that are in them are feeding off of that various emotional energies.
Okay, so we can think of activities like movies, TV, watching sports. The reason why they're so popular in our society is they artificially stimulate the emotional center. Okay, so it causes us to experience a lot of emotions, just like watching a movie and crying at the movie. Well, why would you cry over a movie? It's not real. They're actors. Of course, we all know this, yet we still want to experience that. Just like people that watch horror movies. Why would you be afraid? It's on a television screen. It's not even real, you know, all that kind of stuff. But why is the fear still there? It's because those egos want to feed off that energy. We like doing these activities because they artificially stimulate the center which allows those egos to feed. Just like with the intellectual center, sometimes uh, worrying is a product of the intellectual center. When we find ourselves worrying about things and we start ruminating and we get those thoughts, those you know, get caught in that vicious circle of worry, 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 what we're doing while we're in that is we're feeding various egos associated with that whole process. Emotions have enormous power over us. And in many cases, emotions can override thought. And that's one of the strange things about the emotional center is the sheer power that's associated with the center. We kind of think of the intellect as, as being you know, powerful and being the, 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 the most important aspect. But as we discovered, the motor center, sorry, the intellectual center is one of the slowest centers. And it's not the most powerful. The emotional center is a lot more powerful than the intellectual center, but we don't really give a lot of thought to what goes on and how these energies are used. We've all experienced this before. Anger is an emotion. Okay, that's a really powerful emotion. And when we find ourselves under anger, it easily overrides thought. And we you know, do things that we're embarrassed of or ashamed of or we say things to hurt those around us. We've all done silly things out of anger that we've regretted, that we look back on it and once the emotion is gone, we can look at the situation with the intellect and say, oh no, what did I do? Why did I do that? That was silly. I shouldn't have done that. But at the time, the intellect is nowhere in that process because the anger's taken over and it's pure emotion that's calling the shots. Thoughts come and go, but emotions can last much longer. That's why when we start looking at negative emotions like depression, once that sits down, that's like a really big elephant that walks in the room and sits down, and there's no way you're going to move that one easily. Where thoughts can be seen as you know, little butterflies or hummingbirds that just zip around all over the place. Thoughts come and go fairly quickly, but emotions, they last much longer. When an emotion settles in with us, it's hard to move if it's a negative one. What that tells us is the egos that are feeding off the emotional center are a lot more powerful than the egos that are feeding off of the intellectual center. So that's why we have to be really careful, not just observing our thoughts, not just observing our actions, but also observing the various emotions that we have throughout the day and what those emotions are related to. Because what we discover is a lot of the uh, emotions that we feel throughout the day, a lot of them come through external sources. They're not things that come from within, they come from movies and television and reading books and watching sports events, listening to music. These are things that come from uh, like outside of us. These are things that come externally. Looking next at the instinctive center, the effects of this center happen throughout the entire body. This is a really interesting center. Um, movements from the motor center are learned, for example, walking, um, you know, riding a bike when you were a child, uh, various forms of athletic ability, sports, these are things that we learn. But those of the intellectual center, they're given for basic survival virtually from birth. You can make a loud sound behind a baby and that baby turns around to see where that sound came from. These are movements and emotions that we don't have to learn. They're basically things that we've carried over from the animal kingdom that are based on survival. This center is incredibly fast. It's also a lot faster than the intellect. Um, it's the source of reflexes. If you're about to fall, your hands automatically come out in front of your face. You don't have to stop, thankfully. Oh no, I'm falling. What should I do about this? Whoa, I've got this hand free because your face would already be on the pavement at that point. This is an incredibly fast center. A lot of things that we do here, we're not even aware of it. It happens so quickly, that's why we say it's instinct. Okay, various things, the loud sound behind us, you know, it makes us jump. That's instinct, falling down, putting our hands up to protect ourselves, or something falls, you know, reaching for it to grab it. These are instincts. We can all appreciate how fast this center really is, because we don't even know what's happened until it's over. We don't even know our hands are there until we realize that we've just stopped ourselves from, you know, falling over. Our hands automatically just came out. That's the instinctive center that's responsible for that. 
So jumping when startled, putting hands in front of you when you fall over, these are all activities that are related to the instinctive center. <clears throat> we have various instincts. There's a lot programmed into us. A basic survival instinct, a self-preservation instinct, sexual instincts. What we see is a lot of the instincts that we have are basically borrowed from the animal kingdom. For example, when an animal's hungry, it will seek out food to feed itself. When an animal's thirsty, it will seek out water. An animal will always act to defend its young. When cornered, no matter how small the animal is and how big the attacker, an animal will always attempt to defend itself. An animal will always know at certain points to go out and procreate to continue the species. So these are things that we share with the animal kingdom. The problem is though, once we come into a human kingdom, and we'll, we'll look at this in a couple classes, once we bring along that free will, something really strange happens to a lot of these various instincts. They become almost uh, perverted or corrupted in a sense by the ego, and a lot of the problems that we see stem back to these various instincts. For example, when we overdo the instinct of fight or flight to protect ourselves, now we get aggression and violent behavior. When we overdo the instinct to procreate the species, now we get pornography, lust, prostitution, and that kind of stuff. When we overdo the instinct to feed ourselves, we get into gluttony and the various forms of addiction and alcohol and all that. So a lot of the negative characteristics we find in our, our humanity relate back to corruptions or perversions of the in instincts that we have from the animal kingdom that are given to the ego. So when the ego takes over them, because we have free will, we're able to take these to various extremes. Consequently, the, the negative aspects of the intellectual, or sorry, of the instinctive center are a lot of brutal subhuman instinctive forces. And these things become a real problematic uh, and we have to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the instinctive center because there's a lot of work we have to do to comprehend and eliminate a lot of these, uh, what I'm going to call subhuman instinctive forces. Um, why? Because this is where the source of criminal instincts come from. A lot of criminal behavior. Um, fear is a, a, another one. Like when you think of people who are afraid of public speaking is like the number one fear for all of humanity. We share that. What is so fearful about public speaking? But for some people, that is absolutely terrifying, the prospect of public speaking. It's not a threat to your life. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to make you sick. It's really not going to cause physical pain. Why is that so feared? Once again, the idea of it relates to egos that are feeding off of these emotions. Okay? Fear is important. If there's a giant hairy monster with huge fangs and teeth chasing us, nature says we should be afraid, so we release adrenaline so we can run faster and get out of there. When we're standing you know, off stage about to do a speech and we're sweating and our palms are sweating and our heart racing, that is the same reaction, but it's out of place. And fear for some people can be a really problematic ego that holds them back in life, that prevents them from reaching their full potential because they don't know how to deal with this. An offshoot of fear, of course, is the various phobias. You know, people are afraid of snakes and spiders and, you know, mice and rats. Well, at some point in going in our evolutionary past, it was important to be afraid of snakes. Living in uh, uh, southern Ontario in Canada, it's not important to be afraid of snakes or spiders, yet that instinct is still there and it's still used by the ego. It still uses a way to trigger this emotion, which is a way for the ego to feed off of this energy. So the various fears that we have and the worries that are associated with those are just ways for egos to feed off of this energy. Because each of these centers can be thought of as little computers or little machines or little engines that drive our body. And the problem is while that engine's running, the ego's coming along and it's siphoning off the fuel. And it's through the overuse of these centers that the ego is sustaining itself. And this ends up being a particularly nasty center because some of the more negative aspects of our behavior can have their root in the instinctive center. Okay, so the centers, they have positive attributes and they have negative attributes. The positive attribute to the instinctive center is it will stop us from falling and that kind of thing. The negative aspects is that's where our fear of public speaking is. Or, you know, perhaps people are afraid of being alone, so make, you know, not necessarily good decisions regarding significant others in their life or, you know, people are afraid of all sorts of strange things that hold us back. And that's why part of self-observation is having a look at this as well. What really are the things that we're afraid of? What are the things that are holding us back? 
Next we'll get to the sexual center, and the sexual center, believe it or not, this is the most powerfulest one. This is the fastest of all the five centers, and this is the most powerful of all the five centers. And when you think about it, that makes sense, because this is the center that contains the powers of creation. A thought is an interesting behavior, an emotion is an interesting behavior, but the actions of the sexual center have the ability to create life. The sexual center ends up being the nuclear reactor of the human organism. This is the powerhouse, this is the power plant, and this sexual center supplies the energy which enables the other four centers to run. It's the giant you know, power plant at the top that provides the electricity to run the other four motors. So this is the source, curiously enough, of all the energies that we find in our body. It ends up being the most powerful center and the fastest center. And when we think about it, that makes sense because through this center, we can create new life. We can have all kinds of thoughts that can spawn all kinds of ideas. We can have all kinds of emotions that can lead us different places. But this center can create a brand new life. The energies contained in this, this center are extremely powerful. You can think of it as, a, a, like I said, a nuclear reactor. It contains very powerful transformative energies, and we'll look at that whole process a bit later on in the course. Sex is necessary for filter development when used correctly, but the egos often use the center. Just like every center has a, a positive aspect, it can be used in a positive way, but when given to the ego, it can be used in a negative way. The obvious positive aspects of the sexual center are you know, uh, creating life and that kind of stuff. But when the egos use that center, then we start seeing all the, the strange behaviors that result from things like sexual abuse, uh, sexual fantasy, infidelity, sex crimes, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of negative aspects that relate to the use of this energy as well. Um, if we have an ego that gets really addicted to this energy, that's when we find people, for example, having problems with you know, something like that, viewing pornography. I didn't even realize this until a little while ago, but actually pornography is addictive and you have support groups for it and all kinds of stuff now. That's an example of people that get addicted to uh, the sexual center. Um, I know of a, a, a close female friend whose husband basically sits on the computer all day and is surfing pornography. That's what he does for a large portion of his time. That's somebody who's developing some strong egos around this particular center. And those egos are feeding off of that energy. So he's viewing his pornography, which is stimulating the center, which is then allowing him to feed those particular egos. Uh, the same thing we find with people that, you know, they can't be uh, happy in a relationship. They're constantly with different partners all the time. These are people that have egos that they're trying to feed through this particular center. The problem with this center is because it's so powerful, the egos that we have feeding off of it are extremely uh, problematic. Uh, it processes information faster than the other centers. You're barely even aware of what's going on here half the time. This happens so quickly and so powerfully, you're barely aware of any of its actual actions. Uh, because this is the most powerful center, the sexual egos, the egos that we have associated with the sexual center, they have enormous control over someone. They can even enslave them with their compulsive desires, which is a bit of a, a bold statement to make. Um, but marketers have known this for, for decades now. That's why sex sells. That's why sexual imagery is related from selling everything from, you know, obviously obvious things like clothing to cars, but they put sexual imagery in the strangest stuff, you know, whether it's selling soft drinks or underarm deodorant or whatever, their like sexual Disney imagery. Movies. While Disney movies, it crops up in all mm -hmm. kinds of places. Why does that happen? Because we don't even know what's going on. Because the sexual imagery speaks to us on such a deep level and happens so quickly that using the right imagery, they've, of course, they spend billions a year on this because it's proven again and again and again that sexual imagery, you stimulate the sexual center and you're going to get a response. You show an ad for a car and you, you know, show it to people and hook their brains up to a, a, like an EEG machine so that it measures brain activity, show them the commercial for the car, you get a various response. If you're dealing with a male population, show them that car with a, you know, an attractive woman laid across the hood and of course lights go up everywhere and there's a lot more interest and that's been proven decades ago that sex sells for both males and females as well. 
So this idea that this sector, this center is very powerful and has enormous control and is even capable of enslaving ourselves to a certain degree, that's something that's, you know, you can drive down the road and pass probably the first billboard you'll see and you'll see evidence of this. It's actually all around us all the time and it's becoming even more and more uh, pervasive in our society. There's more and more imagery when we look at media, when we look at television, when we look at what we're directing to our children, or we look at the, the images that we're sending to our, our the young people, when we look at what's happening with you know, younger and younger children and how we started this strange trend of you know, sexing up children that are younger and younger, that's all a result of the center. That's all a result of those egos feeding on these various energies. Now, there's a relationship, as I've been talking about, between the egos and the five centers. If we can imagine ourselves as a marionette, as a puppet, we have five strings coming off of us that are controlled by the puppet masters. Those five strings are the ego and the five centers. The five centers are the way that the ego can interact, control, and influence us. We've talked about the idea that we're, we're under the illusion of control when really we, we, you know, we dance to a different piper. It's the ego that we're dancing to and how the ego controls us is through the five centers. The ego manifests within and controls the five inferior centers. So they're almost like a way for the ego to get into our organism and control and influence us. When we talk about the idea that we're like a small ship tossed about on the stormy waters of the ocean. We simply go where the winds and the waves direct us. The egos create the winds and the waves and how they manifest in our body is through the five centers, through our thoughts, emotions, actions, instincts, and the sexual center itself. That's the, little, the five little buttons the egos have in order to control our actions and influence the course of our lives. Therefore, we have to study the ego in all five centers. We have to see how they use each particular center. We talked about the idea of self-observation, becoming aware of what we're thinking, but now we have to extend that, be aware of what we're thinking, how we're feeling, what it is that we're doing, and in some cases, the whole package, everything that's happening in each of the five centers, and how it influences everything that we're doing. And it's something that we have to really pay attention to. For example, let's say I'm driving a car down the road, and it's in the summer, and it's up near the university, and you know there's an attractive girl on the side and I do one of those head turning things there's a whole course of reactions that led to that there's a whole course of egos that led to that situation so I look at that attractive girl and then I start thinking I start fantasizing I start imagining that's that one ego using all those different centers it used the motor center to turn my head it used the intellectual center to, to plan to fantasize it uses the emotional center it uses all of that stuff to dissolve the ego within ourselves, we have to study its function in the five inferior centers. It's not really just the thoughts. We can always spend too much time on the, the thoughts. We forget about the emotions. We forget about the instincts. We forget about the relationship with the sexual center. The faster the center becomes, the more harder it is, sorry, the more harder it is for us to figure out what's actually going on there. And many times we'll see that there's a relationship here. We'll be feeling a certain emotion which will generate certain thoughts which will produce certain actions. We can all see this in people we're familiar with. You can look at somebody that you know really well, you just know that they're in a good mood or a bad mood. Just by their posture, their body language, the way they're talking, the inflection in their voice. So when we think of something like being, you know, being depressed, it's not just an emotion. It's an emotion plus a range of thoughts plus a range of actions. It has a root cause. It's related to a, a various center or other. When we talk about self-observation, that's the whole picture that we're going for. It's not just, you know, I'm feeling really angry, but okay, you felt anger. Why? What are the thoughts related with that anger? What is it doing to you emotionally? What is it doing to you physically? Are you wringing your hands? Are your shoulders all hunched up? Is it you know, causing your lower back problems? Is it generating stress? We have to be aware of what's happening in all the five centers because the five centers are the way that the ego interacts with our physical body. So when we have an emotion or a thought or we're in a various situation, we have to check into all five of these centers to see what's going on there. Each center, as we'll discover through our own observation, has a complicated set of actions and reactions. And it changes depending on the individual person. We'll all have our own different way of responding to fear. We'll all have our own different way of responding to a happy situation, to responding to anger, to responding to depression. We'll all have our own set of actions and reactions. Part of self-observation is to discover those. 
because they are mechanical. X happens, you know, A plus B always equals C. We are aware of C, but now we have to go backwards and see, well, what was A and what was B? How did I arrive at this state? And sometimes what we discover is there's a pattern. Sometimes it can be that if you have a, uh, a particular, let's say that you're depressed, it can be something, you know, like you drive by, uh, it's, you drive down the street and you see, a, you know, a couple holding hands happy. And that will generate depression. Perhaps when I'm lonely, I wish I had that happiness, I wish I had that kind of relationship. And that generates a whole set of actions and reactions that then influences your thoughts for the day or perhaps the week or perhaps the month. Many of the things that, that we have, emotions and feelings and thoughts, they're simply a reaction. Part of self-observation is discovering that equation, discovering that process, seeing what that action is, observing the reaction, but then seeing all the different things that were put into place to create that reaction. In any situation, you're always asking yourself, what am I thinking, what am I feeling, and what am I doing? Trying to be aware of all of those things. Okay, not just the thoughts that we have, but also the emotions and also the action. We all have various actions that are related many times to the various thoughts that we have and the various feelings. And everything that we do is a complicated series of actions and reactions that all relate to each other. When we look at the five centers, we can go so f even a bit uh, farther and we can break them down into what we refer to as the three brains. We are primarily controlled by three centers. You can take the three centers and you can group them into what we call the three brains, the three um, driving forces of the human organism. You've got the intellectual center, you've got the motor slash instinctive slash sexual center, and you've got the emotional center. So we usually uh, take the motor center and we group that in with the instinctive, because the instinctive relates to actions, and we usually group that in with the sexual as well. But these are the three brains. The interesting thing about this is people typically overuse or waste energy in one brain more than the others. Okay? The way you can look at this, the thinkers, the doers, and the feelers. Okay? And odds are you belong to one of those categories. The intellectuals are the thinkers. They're the people that, that tend to worry. They're the people that you know, live in the intellectual center. These are the people that would be... Uh, academics. These are the people that will enjoy reading, learning, taking courses, and that kind of stuff. You've got the motor center. These are people that live in the physical body. These are people that really like physical activity. They like sports. They like working out, and that kind of thing. And then you've got the emotional people. These tend to be, now granted these are a little bit stereotypical sometimes, these are your artists. These are your feelers. These are people that, that would, you know, enjoy um, watching a good movie, would enjoy music, would enjoy going out to an art gallery. The thinkers, the doers, and the feelers. If you're trying to decide what category you belong to, uh, you know, when something negative happens in your life, what do you do? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think about it? Do you read? Do you figure out how to get out of it? Do you plot? Do you think? Are you the type of person that would throw something or punch a hole in the wall or want to go for a jog? Or are you the type of person that wants to go and lock themselves in a dark room, put on some sad music, and cry about it for a while? The, 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 as funny as that is, that's really what a lot of humanity breaks down into. The thinkers, the feelers, and the doers. As a result of that, people are defined by one brain. So if you find yourself the, the intellectual type, um, we often say that in our society is a compliment. To say somebody's intellectual is a compliment. I don't mean it like that in this case. Okay? I personally end up being the intellectual type. That does not mean I'm you know, very smart or anything else like that. It just means I overuse this center. The majority of my egos feed off of that energy. I'm not a very athletic coordinated type person, and I'm not a very emotional person either. I'm a very heavily leaning towards the side of the intellectual. I, one of my biggest problems with egos, I worry about everything. I'm a worrier. I just, that intellectual process goes on and on and on and on and on. And for an intellectual, uh, worrying is a really big problem. Okay? So people end up being defined by one brain. The problem with that is we're not using these energies in a balanced fashion. Me being an intellectual, me being a worrier, I'm constantly draining the energy from this motor. And eventually that motor runs out of energy and it doesn't function properly. So the intellectuals are the academics, those that are continually learning and caught up in reading and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's the motor people, those are people that are into sports, working out, fitness. They're usually very athletic, very coordinated. 
Uh, and then there's the emotional people. They like art, movies, music, and that kind of stuff. People that enjoy you know, sitting around and watching a, a good movie and getting caught up in the story and theater, those kind of things. Now, they're usually um, a bit stereotypical. And it's not always to be intellectual. I don't like music and movies because I'm an intellectual, but I'm also a musician. I enjoy playing music. And it's not that I'm totally you know, out, out of shape or anything else like that. I do exercise and, and work out to a certain extent. It's just really this one. I would be like overwhelming this, like maybe 80% this, 10% and 10%. Okay, so it's not that to be intellectual, you can't do any of those activities. It's just when you really examine your own life and your own thoughts and your actions, you're going to discover you keep going back to the same center more often than the other ones. That's just because the balance of egos that you have are feeding off of one center more than the rest. What that means is we're not using all those energies in a balanced fashion. So consequently, we find the energy systems in our body in a real state of imbalance. And that has a various sets of consequences we'll look at over the course of the next few weeks. We only have so much energy or fuel in each center, and this is the problem. Once we drain that center, it runs out of gas, and it starts trying to take fuel from the other centers. And the problem is, it's like the intellectual center is the gas burning engine, but the emotional center is the diesel burning engine. And what happens is when we run out of gas, we try to put diesel fuel in the regular gas burning engine. And you know if you tried that with your car, you'd have all kinds of engine problems. It's the same thing in a human. When we run out of the intellectual energy, we start taking energy from other centers, which creates a real imbalance. Next thing you know, you've got sexual energies in the intellectual center and emotional, and it's all mixed up and it's all over the place. Uh, that process can go so far as producing physical death. If we keep overusing one center and waste all the energy contained there, one of the implications of that is an earlier death than was in, than well, dying earlier than we needed to die. There's all kinds of physical consequences as a result from overusing the three centers or the three brains. To live correctly, we have to balance the energy between all centers. We have to equally use the emotional, the intellectual, and the motor centers. We have to balance the way that we use those energies. In order to balance the way we use the energies, we then have to eliminate that which creates the imbalance in the first place. That which created the imbalance was, of course, the ego. The intellectual center with the constant worrying and plotting and the planning, those are the egos which are feeding off the intellectual energies. While we still carry those egos, we're always going to be overstimulating the intellectual center. When we learn to eliminate those egos, then we can not use the intellectual center so much and start to live in a more of a balanced fashion, making sure those internal energies are all in the right place and to make sure we're using them in a balanced fashion. Conservation and wise use of energy prolongs life. Many ancient schools knew this. We've all heard the stories about the Tibetan monks that lived to be 200 years old and that kind of stuff. One of their secrets for doing this was they were aware of, the, aware of this process. They knew how to properly maintain those centers. The concept of, of elimination of the ego was something that they knew and something that they worked with. While they tried to eliminate the ego, they were able to work with balancing the energies and preventing a lot of the physical and negative aspects that come from the imbalance of the energies, from not using energies properly. We have to study ourselves. Part of this process of nasate ipsum, know thyself, we have to study ourselves to see which centers we are over or under using. Part of doing that is a observing the various egos interacting in our physical organism. And where do we find those egos feeding? We find ourselves under uh, a lot of egos that use the emotional center, or are we under the influence of a lot of egos that use the intellectual center, or the motor center. That's something that we have to uncover during that process of self-observation. Examples of consequences of overusing our centers. So let's say we look at somebody that overuses the intellectual center. Well, what we find is as we get older, we find a lot of mental problems associated with that. Things like um, Alzheimer's and, and dementia and stuff like that. That's what happens when we've overused, when we've literally blown the motor of the intellectual center. When we've been using the over, overusing the intellectual center for our entire life, that's like overusing a car engine. Eventually the engine wears down faster and we see all kinds of different pro mental problems associated with the overuse of the intellectual center. 
overusing the motor center, that's actually something that we're familiar with. We can all kind of relate to this one. When we overuse the motor center, that's when we start getting into physical ailments, various forms of paralysis, joint troubles, all kinds of stuff. And that's typical of people that, you know, do lead a, an overly active life. People that, you know, do spend a lot of time doing things like weightlifting or, you know, long distance running or, or biking. If they're not careful, over time they end up causing all kinds of damage to the joints. This one kind of makes sense we can relate to. But just like, you know, the same process that's happening here by wearing down those physical joints, well, we can wear ourselves down mentally as well. Uh, emotional overusing the emotional center, that's a common symptom of overusing the emotional center. Um, various forms of, of depression are a result of just de constantly depleting the energies in the emotional center, constantly feeding those egos, and the end result when we're drained emotionally, uh, depression is a, is a huge uh, a problem there. And that's something that we can see becoming, um, referring to it as the, you know, the new epidemic in our society is depression and that the prescription of drugs for treating depression because there's a lot of, of this going on with, with television and with music and, and sports events and all that kind of stuff and become very addicted as a culture to the emotional energies. When we look at all these centers, the emotional center is the hardest one to control. The motor center is pretty easy to control. You just don't do anything. So if you, you know, find yourself uh, in a situation where you're constantly overusing the motor center, that's easy. Think of a different hobby. You know, that's, that's kind of something you can relate to. The intellectual center, that's harder to control, but it is possible. Part of the process of meditation and learning how to meditate is all about controlling the center. It's difficult at first, but with practice, we can control the intellectual center. We can turn it off. Just like we could you know, control the motor center by sitting down on the couch, we can control the intellectual center through meditation. That's the whole process of meditation. There's a good chunk of that devoted to controlling the intellectual center. The emotional one, that's difficult. It's not simply as easy as you know, blanking your mind and remaining motionless. The emotional center is a bit harder to control. Okay? The motor is easy to control, intellectual is harder, but can be dominated with meditation as an example. But the emotional center is a bit more difficult to control. Can I have a question? Yes. Um, the um, emotional center, I thought the uh, ancestor of every emotion was a thought. The ancestor of every emotion was a thought. Not necessarily. Not necessarily? No. When you start looking at how the different egos interact, they can be, in some cases they are related, as we'll see, and if you get observed in yourself, sometimes the thought comes first, followed by the emotion, followed by the action. Sometimes the emotion comes first, followed by the thought, followed by the action. Sometimes they're all tied together. But there's different egos that are associated with each of those centers. Okay. But we'll see later on, uh, oftentimes the egos in some situations can actually work together create all kinds of various effects. Now looking at controlling various emotions, negative emotions and feelings, they're particularly difficult to control. Uh, we looked at earlier things like depression and sadness, they're, they're really hard to control. That's the big elephant that comes in and sits down and you really can't move that very easily. Uh, what we'll look at is an interesting little story and that leads to a tip to how we can work with some of these negative emotions, how we can learn to gain control over that emotional center. And you may have discovered some of this on your own, you just might not have realized this is what you're doing. Uh, in ancient Hindu teachings, the emotional center was compared to a crazy elephant. Okay, they often called the emotional center the crazy elephant. So when I used the story earlier about an elephant coming in and sitting down, that's where I got that from. Now, to the Hindu culture, elephants were important. They were all the bulldozers and cranes of the time, right? When elephant handlers would come across an elephant that was difficult to control, they had a trick. They would place that elephant between two well-behaved good elephants to make it behave. So they used to use elephants for lifting weights and you know, moving trees and all kinds of stuff. So let's use the stereotypical example of elephants ripping trees out with their trunks, pushing trees over. Um, every once in a while, there'd be an elephant that wouldn't do what it was told. They would, you know, call that the crazy elephant. It would misbehave, it wouldn't pull its trees, it would run around all over the place. Uh, the ancient elephant handlers, the people that would train and, and, and deal with the elephants, they knew a trick to make that elephant behave. 
they would have their two good elephants, and they'd put that bad one right in between. And the bad one would look beside it. Oh, that's pulling out a tree. Oh, he's pulling out a tree. I guess I'm supposed to pull out a tree. And he'd do what he was told and start and stop misbehaving. So that was the story of the elephant handlers. Believe it or not, in that story is a trick for how we can learn to work with our negative emotions. We have to control the emotional center with the intellectual and the motor centers. We have to put our crazy elephant between our two well-behaved elements. This is the one we hardly have any control over. This is the easy one to control, and this is the other one that we can control as well. So by understanding how to control these, it can lead to controlling this one. If we find ourselves identifying with negative emotions, let's say we find ourselves depressed or angry or, or worrying or something like that, the way we look at this is we should lie down in bed or lie down on an easy chair, relax, and make our mind go blank, which is the same thing as saying meditating. So if we find ourselves you know, overly depressed or, or under the influence of a negative emotion, you want to bring up the two good elephants. So step one is basically control the motor center slow the motor center down, which you could just by simply lying in bed. Step two is slow the intellectual center down. To slow the intellectual center down, you could focus on meditation. The end result of that is lying down and relaxing controls the motor center. Remembering that usually we have movements that accompany negative emotional states. Tapping our fingers, wringing our hands. That's helping sustain that negative emotion because it's helping feed those same group of egos that brought it into existence in the first place. Okay? Making the mind goes blank, making the mind, sorry, go blank controls the intellectual center because associated with that negative emotion is various thoughts. The end result of these two, and this is a really interesting thing, and hopefully at some point you get a chance to experience this for yourself, uh, this causes the emotional center to calm down as well. So step one, slow down the motor center. Step two, slow down the intellectual center. And then the interesting thing happens where in response, the emotional center slows down as well. Once you take away the egos feeding through the motor center, pull out the egos feeding through the intellectual center, there's not much left to sustain the emotional center. Okay, so that's a little tip for you to try next time you find yourself in this situation. And we're all familiar with this. Uh, the simpler versions of this would be when you're angry, you know, count to 10 or, you know, take a deep breath. Why? What does that do? Taking that deep breath helps relax and slow down the motor center. Counting to 10 takes your mind off of it onto something else to slow down the intellectual center. And result, usually you find the anger dissipates as well. So a more complicated version is this version right here. So next time you're in that situation, uh, give that a try. What you'll find is it's actually quite effective. Lying down and meditating allows you to come back and look at the problem or look at the situation with a completely different light, which allows you to read or reach usually a lot more of a, a faster solution and a lot less uh, problems associated with you know, things like anger, depression, and fear, because when you let these guys drive the car, then you sometimes end up you know, in a completely different direction from where you need to be. But simply lying down, blanking the mind, slowing down the motor center, that's enough to slow down the emotional center so you can stay in the present moment, so you can really examine the problem or the situation for what it is and come to a, a, a proper solution rather than a solution driven out of fear or out of anger or depression or something like that. We can also use the superior emotions to control the inferior emotions. Remember we had the five lower centers, but we also had the possibility of developing a superior emotional center and a superior intellectual center. We can do things that help develop that superior emotional center which will override the inferior emotional center. The superior emotional center is a higher version that relates solely to the consciousness, the essence. The ego can't use the superior emotional center and the ego can't use the superior intellectual center. Uh, for example, intuition is something that's related with the superior intellectual center. That's a faculty that belongs to the consciousness and is related to the uh, superior intellectual center. The superior emotional center is something that we can use to override the inferior emotional center. Um, 
what we find is we're usually under the influence of inferior emotions. We find ourselves being blasted by the media with negative news and shocking stuff, um, music, movies, art, alcohol. These are things that all stimulate the inferior emotional center because these are activities that are associated with various egos. When we engage in this behavior, we're basically feeding those egos, allowing them to use those energies, which makes the ego grow stronger. So as time goes on, we end up building the ego stronger and stronger at the expense of our essence, at the expense of our higher self. Instead, try listening. If you find yourself under the influence of a negative emotion, try listening to classical music. Try doing a meditation. Try going for a walk in nature. These are activities which stimulate the superior emotional center. Just being out, going for a walk in the woods. There's lots of great trails in London, lots of great conservation areas. Simply just being around nature stimulates the superior emotional center. Listening to classical music, we'll see later on that a lot of these classical composers, people like Beethoven, these, were awake, these guys were awakened masters. Their music had all kinds of things coded in it, and a lot of classical music can help us to reach a different state of consciousness by stimulating the superior emotional center. Okay, so simply instead of listening to you know rock and roll or blues or country, these are things that as soothing as they are, they're capable of feeding of various egos which causes the problem to, to spiral. But listening to classical music instead can override the inferior emotional center, allowing this one to prevail. And then what comes with it is a different state of consciousness and a different uh, way of looking at the problem or whatever circumstance is causing the negative emotion. Okay, so these activities will help develop the superior emotional center. And that's why one of the things that they talk about now for children is actually playing children classical music. They've noted that it helps them learn and uh, helps pe children that have uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorders. And they discovered that classical music does all these wonderful things, but you know, no one really understands why. They've just done all kinds of studies and they've noted some, some correlations there. But when we look at things Gnostically, we say, well, of course it's helping the children because it's developing this center. And this center is a product of the consciousness, not the product of the ego. While this center is active, you've got more of the consciousness manifesting to the individual and less of the ego. And of course, the consciousness isn't associated with things like anger and you know, uh, ADHD and kids and, and that kind of stuff. One of the goals that we have on this path is to gain control over the three brains and stop wasting the various types of energy. For an intellectual, we find ourselves constantly worrying and planning, which is wasting the intellectual energy, as an example. Remembering it is the egos which waste our energy. The nasty thing about the egos, and this is a little bit of a, a difficult thing to think about, they're almost like parasites. The egos are literally feeding off that energy. When you react to something with anger, that's the ego that's appearing in your physical body. That's the ego of anger taking hold of the steering wheel of the car. Remember, the car is your personality, your physical body, and that's the ego saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do like this, 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 and this, whether that's, you know, say angry words or lash out or something like that. The whole time we identify with anger, we feed the ego of anger. Every time we identify with an ego, we're sustaining it. We're feeding it. It's like a big angry dog that we keep in the backyard that we're afraid of, but every day we throw a steak so the dog gets bigger and stronger and meaner. And that's what happens from lifetime to lifetime. And we'll see later on, when I think it's next week's class, we'll look at how we've been carrying these egos for lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, allowing them to grow bigger and bigger and bigger along the way at the extent of our essence, our consciousness, our higher self. The egos which waste our energy because they're feeding on it. Every time we identify with a thought, an emotion, and a feeling or whatever, we're sustaining them, we're feeding them. We have to balance the use of the three brains to conserve the energies properly. And there's a whole process of this that we'll look at through the uh, development of this course on conservation of the energies, balancing the centers, which not only is better physically and, and help our physical health, but also it's a better thing to do spiritually as well. Uh, so this is your homework. Uh, pick a time during a routine activity. So something that you're going to do every day, whether it's your morning routine, and be fully conscious of your actions. Be in the moment and do nothing mechanically. Okay, so you could say, okay, when I get ready in the morning, when I do my morning routine of coffee, shower, shave, whatever it is that you do, you could say, I'm going to be conscious for this. 
It could be multiple things throughout the day. Tying your shoes. Or sorry, not tying. Uh, tying, tying your shoes. Uh, another silly one, going to the bathroom. Okay, washing the dishes. If you're washing the dishes consciously, and as silly as this sounds, I mean you're, I am picking up the plate, I'm putting it in the sink, I'm washing it, I'm rinsing it, I put it in the rack, I'm going to get another one. It seems like a silly thing to do, but that's better than, oh, what am I going to do at work tomorrow? I'm really not looking forward to this weekend. Going through everything in a routine. Okay, a really good one, which I wish everyone would do, is how about driving to and from work? Maybe that's your assignment. When I'm in the vehicle, when I'm sitting behind the car, I am conscious. I'm in the present moment. I'm not identifying with a thought. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm not going into my memories. I'm not worrying about the future. I am here in the now, living in the now, the eternal instant, being aware that I am in the car, being aware of the car, being aware of everything around you, being aware of what's in your mirrors. That's a great activity to practice being conscious, to not being a robot. And it's, it's a, a strange thing to say. We don't want to think of ourselves as robots, but so much of our day is routine. There's so many aspects of our life that are mechanical. One small instant a day of living consciously has amazing impact on the course of our life. When we act in the present <coughs> moment, when we wash the dishes and physically be there, what we're doing, it's like exercise for the consciousness. Okay, and over time, the consciousness will grow and develop. Okay, just like if you're want to lose weight, you exercise a little bit every day and next thing you know a couple months have gone by and you've lost a bunch of weight. It's the same thing as working with the consciousness. You pick a time during a routine activity to be conscious, you do that every day, over time you're slowly developing that consciousness. And what you discover is you spend less time identifying with egos. When you have things like anger and other emotions trying to manifest, you have more control over that. You don't identify with the ego as easily. You're able to stay in that present moment. So that's your homework for the next week. Something you're going to do every day. It doesn't have to be very long. Something like driving to work. Something like getting ready in the morning. Something like doing the dishes or tying your shoes. Something you're going to do at regular points. And that activity for you is going to be a trigger. It's going to be... I'm going to be conscious in this moment. I'm not going to identify with the thoughts that show in my mind. I'm not going to identify with the images projected on the screen of my mind. I'm not going to identify with those emotions. I'm going to be here in the now doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And if you develop that practice enough, it leads to all kinds of different revelations. One of the first things you notice when you try to be conscious is how much of a force the ego is. It attempts to distract you more and more in crazier different ways. And that really allows you to understand a bit more about the ego. So once a day, uh, routine activity. If everyone did this for driving, I think everyone would pay like hardly any insurance every month and the roads would be a much safer place. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But driving is a good one, getting ready in the morning. If there's a, something you do at work at a certain time every day, a routine activity at work, you could do that as well, especially if you're working around heavy machinery or something like that. That'd be a great time, too, to be conscious in the present moment because there's a less chance of accidents or anything else like that. Any questions about that? Yeah. As far as you're washing dishes are concerned, <laughs> to me, that is tremendously boring. And you turn your mind off simply because you don't want to be looking at yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you think of some, trying to think of something more pleasant to pass it to. Mm -hmm. by. So what are you doing wrong there? Why am I having to you, do something crappy, <laughs> really, when I could think of something pleasant and make the time go more pleasant? Well, we do that with all kinds of aspects of our lives, right? Yeah. Where we, we, there's an activity we don't want to do and we'll spend our time somewhere else. When you're doing that, when you I don't want to wash the dishes, this is a boring, crappy thing. I'm going to think about the summer and the good time I had in the summer because that's more pleasant. Well, now you've gone back in the past. Now the egos and those memories are taking you back and you're living those experiences. And your consciousness, which is in that present moment, you've forgotten all about that. But if you can stay there and be in that room and wash those dishes, that's working with the consciousness. And the stronger we develop the consciousness, the more we're going to be aware of the various egos. So simply washing the dishes, it seems like a silly thing to do, but after weeks of doing that, we've made the consciousness a little bit stronger. So next time we find ourselves under the influence of anger, rather than simply giving into that anger and saying something bad or lashing out, suddenly we go, wait a sec, why am I angry? I don't need to be angry. This doesn't matter. I shouldn't react like this. There was a split second that allowed you to reconsider that. That was the consciousness being able to speak. 
So when you have an activity like that, is that, I don't know if this dovetails correctly or not, but is this, is that why some people who try to multitask have so much trouble? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we like to think of our, ourselves as effective multitaskers, yeah. but it's scientific fact that we're really, really bad at it. We like to think of ourselves, and the world does demand it, and more and more businesses are demanding it of their employees, and they've done a lot of studies to discover that humans are really bad multitaskers. The more you ask us to multitask, uh, it's the jack of all trades, master of none is one of those analogies.